All right, so in this discussion, I'm going to go over an article written by the World Bank called What is Development? And the main themes here or questions that to be answered are how do you know which countries are more developed than others? Um, how good is a GDP at measuring development? So these themes should sound familiar. What are some negative things that can arise along with increased GDP? So should GDP growth be the goal of development? And what is intergenerational equity? Okay, so this um, there's an article <clears throat> that was uh, that's posted um, called What is Development by the World Bank? So just for a little bit of context here, the World Bank is uh, basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a bank uh, that is a global bank that countries across the world contribute to the bank. And similar to, if you remember, that the International Monetary Fund that we refer to in the Social and Environmental Justice um, the lesson, the World Bank's very similar. Um, although it's not quite, the World Bank, uh, they, they do lend money, but the bigger thing that they do is they sort of promote development. Um, so they will give loans, but they'll also provide just funding for people, um, for countries, excuse me, to to help them, quote unquote, develop as a society, whether, you know, their, their stated goal is poverty reduction, but um, they do all kinds of things, help develop economies, fund renewable energy, fund anti-poverty programs, and so forth. The, the interesting thing about the World Bank with regards to this article is that they aren't known as a sustainability organization by any stretch. They're known as like a, run, you know, an organization that's that's run by these wealthy countries in the world that has sort of um, a somewhat of a self-serving agenda, similar to the IMF. So the the things that the World Bank ends up doing tends to benefit the countries that are funding the World Bank, and also often the countries that they're that they provide the funding to. Regardless, the World Bank is not known as a sustainability organization, just to be clear. Then there's actually a lot of criticism about the World Bank and how they treat lower income countries and how they treat sustainability, although they are getting better. Okay, so that's a little bit of context. So I want you to think about what, what is most commonly used to measure a country's development. <clears throat> and far and away, it's, it's GDP per person or GDP, um, most often GDP per capita, okay? Now it may not be, uh, you know, stated that this country is more developed than another because it has a higher GDP, but it's at least implied that wealthier countries generally are more developed. Okay, um, and and just a a, a term a term that you might see I think that was in um, this article is something called purchasing power parity. Sounds pretty fancy, but all it means is um, the cost of living is different in different countries. And so when you look at a GDP per capita number, um, you need it's important to understand how expensive it is to live in that country on average. So a good example would be, you know, a salary of, let's say, $30,000 a year in the United States. That's considered generally considered low income, um, especially if you're trying to raise a family. Whereas if you have $30,000 a year in, say, Bangladesh or a lot of sub-Saharan African countries or even China, that's actually a pretty decent salary. So what purchasing power parity does is it actually adjusts um, the income level to reflect how you know the cost of living in the in the area that you're in. Okay, so that's just an FYI. You'll you'll see that in uh, in today. Okay, so in this article, the World Bank mentions that indicators of wealth they really only reflect the quantity of resources available but they provide no information about the allocation of those resources, okay? So that's a w first important point about GDP per capita numbers, okay? So remember, we're looking at w how do we measure how developed a country is. Now, if we just look at GDP per person, a big problem is that it that's only the average. It doesn't tell you how well distributed it is. So you could have the, the few, you know, the 1%, the 5% that have most of the money, and the rest of the people don't have much. You can still have a, a high GDP, okay? So that's a, uh, an important thing. Um, it also does not include, you know, whether or not they have free health care and education opportunities. I mean, you could have a high income country that doesn't offer health care and education, the United States being an example of, of that, at least for the, the health care. Um, also, it's important to keep in mind that the, the stuff we've talked about um, with the, the, the way that GDP is generated often results in negative impacts on people's environment. Um, it also doesn't necessarily reflect social justice, environmental justice, and equity, okay? And so 
you can have countries that have similar average income. So your average, you know, your GDP per capita can be very, very similar, but they can, that doesn't mean that they're all developed to the same extent, okay? And as the World Bank says, they, it can differ, the, the quality of life um, of the people in those countries can differ substantially, even if the GDP is the same. So you have to look at things like, do they have access to healthcare? Do they have employment opportunities? Do they have clean air, safe drinking water? All the stuff we're talking about, environmental justice, social justice, right? Equity, all these things. Um, the, the point the World Bank's trying to make is that just because someone has a high GDP per capita doesn't mean that they have all of these things that, again, people generally consider as um, necessary parts of a high quality of life. And so the overarching question that they're asking here is, okay, so GDP per capita, you know, it, it has its usefulness, but there are some inadequacies of it. And so they want to, you know, sort of analyze and think about how do we actually determine which countries are more developed and which are less, okay? And so they ask the question, what what is the goal or what are the goals of development? Okay, is it just monetary, you know, or, or are, do we go, do we look at, well-being, do we want to promote freedom, have economic security? So a country can be wealthy, but not economically secure. And the United States would be a good example of that. We are a very wealthy country on a GDP per capita basis, um, but there are a lot of people in the United States that are very economically insecure, and that has a lot to do with the, the distribution of the wealth in the country. Anyway, they're starting out from a basic question of how do we like how do we measure how well developed a country is and what are in, in order to determine that maybe we should think about what are the actual goals of development and is is um the current metric you know gdp per capita does it actually measure these things okay and so they do to be clear the world bank understands that economic growth does provide the potential for a country to reduce poverty and promote you know well-being and solve these other social problems okay but, and this is from the article, history, they, they state that history shows that increased economic activity can also lead to these things that we don't consider as um, elements of, of a highly developed country or quality of life. So inequality, unemployment, weak democracy, lots of cultural identi identity, sorry for the misspelling there, overconsumption of natural resources, right? So all of these things, again, this is coming from the World Bank who generally speaking, promotes economic development at, at the cost of other things. And they're saying, well, actually, with economic development, it, it helps because it can lead to these good things. But there's, you know, there's ample evidence that economic development, economic growth can also lead to these things that we don't want, okay? So let's look um, quickly, you know, how increased economy can lead to greater inequality. Um, now, this is evidence that we've seen before when we looked at social and environmental justice. Remember, um, in the United States, we've had economic growth uh, basically, you know, for the most part since we began as a country. Um, but if you look at just the last 30 years or so, the inequality has increased, right? So CEO pays up, typical worker pays pretty flat. We remember we looked at this, the health, um, uh, health access and quality index. Okay, this is globally. So again, the global GDP overall has grown over the past decades, but we have a lot of inequality across the world. We look at the average household income. Again, this is in the United States. Top, five, you know, the top five, ten, twenty percent are doing really well. Um, and then the bottom half. Okay, so you look at the bottom twenty percent. Actually, the bottom forty percent. Actually, the bottom sixty percent. Excuse me. They're pretty flat. Okay, so again, this is greater inequality, which is the point. So one concept I want to introduce here, and this wasn't was not in your reading, so I'm going to go over this. Um, something called the Gini coefficient, um, and it, it basically here's how it works. If you look at a chart, and so you take a population, could be a country, could be uh, a state, whatever. Usually, this is done by country. And so if you actually chart out the income in that country by doing this, so you have, this is the cumulative percent of all, all of the income, okay? So 0% of the income, all of the income. And this is the cumulative percentage of the population, okay? From the poorest to the richest. So we'll look at the two extremes first. So 0% of the people have 0% of the money, right? 
Makes sense. And then 100% of the people in that country make 100% of all the money, okay? So what you what you do to determine the Gini coefficient is you actually chart. So like if 20% of the people in this in this chart, um, well, let's look at the ideal. If everybody had the same amount of money, okay, you would end up with this line because 20% of the people would have 20% of the money. 40% of the people would have 40% of the money. 60% of the people would have 60% of the money and so forth. So if everybody had the exact same amount of income, this line would be perfectly diagonal at a perfect 45 degree angle. Now that's not realistic. We don't expect that to happen. But what the but what the Gini coefficient does is it actually when you chart it, and again this is from the poorest to the richest in the country. So if in let's follow this line here. So 20% of the people you follow it up to this line make about let's say seven percent of the money forty percent of the people make about ten percent of the money sixty percent of the people make thirty percent eighty percent of the people make about forty percent and so on okay and so you actually to determine the Gini coefficient you actually chart out how each percent of the population how much of the income they make and it's gonna it's gonna be less okay so it's going to be different than this one. it's going to kind of sag because you don't expect everyone to have the same amount of income it's just not realistic but here's the key this area here see this shaded area a if this whole triangle okay the shaded area once what you do is you calculate the percent of this triangle okay that's filled with this area and so the smaller this area the closer you are to the perfect distribution of income. The bigger, imagine pulling this line out. So if like almost very few people had almost all the money, you'd have the curve would be way out here. Okay, so you'd have a really big area that's shaded. And so if there's no difference between this line and this line, the area is zero. Okay, and so that's perfectly distributed income. The closer you get to the this line filling up the whole area, okay, the worse the income is distributed. So I don't expect you to quite understand this. I mean, if you're interested in it, you can read up on it a little bit more. But the bottom line here is that with the Gini coefficient, a lower Gini means less inequality, which means a lower Gini means this line is really close to that ideal distribution line. The higher Gini means this line is way out here, which means most of the money is made by most uh, by the relative wealthy few. Okay, so Gini coefficient is a, actually a really well known. Um, it's used in economics a lot. It's, it's a really known statistic that helps measure in a real, like a single number, how um, well distributed or poorly distributed the income in a country is. Okay, so that's your Gini coefficient. So just remember that the lower Gini means less inequality, and a higher Gini means more inequality. So let's look at some Gini coefficients. Um, I apologize, I'm not sure. I think this is from 2012, but um, the numbers won't change that much. So what this shows is your OECD, so your wealthier countries in the world. Okay, and so this chart orders Gini coefficients before taxes. Okay, this is these are all countries, right? And so this is a high Gini meaning high inequality, low Gini meaning lower inequality. So if, in case you can't read, I mean, um, the numbers there might be hard to see. So the U.S. is right here. So the U.S. is the ninth worst, okay? So the worst is Poland here with a 0.57. The U.S. is ninth worst. If you go to the other extreme, you have Korea, Switzerland, Iceland, Finland, Denmark. So the top five most equal, okay, distribution of incomes, are mostly Nordic and uh, Central European countries, okay? So that's before taxes. So remember, U.S. is number nine, worst. Now, after taxes, what happens is the U.S. jumps from number nine to actually number two, the second worst. So after taxes, the U.S. actually becomes less equal than other countries. And then again, we have our Denmark, Sweden, Luxembourg, Finland, Netherlands, so all of our European, mostly Nordic countries. So once you think about what this indicates in terms of the tax structure in the United States, and the bottom line is, in the U.S., 
we're pretty unequal. So let's go back to this chart. We're number nine. So we're pretty bad, at least in terms of inequality, before taxes. But we get even worse, okay, so we're uh, jumped to number two, second worst, after taxes. So what that means is other countries across the world tend to have a more progressive tax structure, meaning their taxes um, help redistribute the wealth more evenly across the country. Now, this is a very controversial topic. I mean, let's start talking about taxes and wealth redistribution in the United States. Very tricky topic. But the numbers are pretty clear that the U.S. has a rel does not have a very progressive tax structure. And this is not this is not a, a mystery. This is very well known that these countries like Denmark and Sweden, these European countries, northern and western European countries, tend to have higher tax rates, and they distribute the wealth a little more evenly. But this is a pretty clear uh, way to show that that's the case. It's not just like anecdotal. Yeah, we know that you know Denmark has high taxes. Well, the numbers bear all that out. Okay, and so Gini is Gini coefficient is a, a good quick way to measure the economic inequality in a country. All right, so back to the World Bank. Um, they note again that economic growth leads to some other things like overconsumption of natural resources needed by future generations. So if you look at the evidence we've already looked at before, if you look at ecological, here's income versus ecological footprint. So higher income, if you look at, you know, the trend is up. So that this just means that as income increases, your ecological footprint tends to increase as well. Again, this is kind of supporting that notion. And each of these dots is a country. And then we've looked at this before with our ecological footprint, right? So we have our wealthier countries in the world that have the higher ecological footprints in general, okay? All right, so the last few things here. First of all, they mentioned um, that if if these environmental, social, and human losses, like so all these things that, that I've mentioned uh, that can result as a, as a result of economic growth, you know, increased ecological footprint, um, negative things that happen to people, greater inequality, and so forth. So they can say that that sometimes these losses can actually um, be higher than the economic benefits, okay? And so if that happens overall, the result for people's well-being becomes negative. In other words, from an externality implicate perspective, basically what they're saying here is, is we can have all this economic growth, but we have all these externalized, these extra costs that are associated with that growth that results in people's well-being being negatively impacted overall, that maybe we should consider all of the impacts of that economic growth and reconsider what we're actually pursuing. And they, they also note that economic growth relies on pollution absorption and natural regeneration. So again, all this stuff we've been talking about um, is, is recognized um, by people like the World Bank who normally are, are pretty strict advocates of, of economic growth. They also uh, acknowledge that economic growth itself relies on development. So, so if we want economic growth to occur, it's kind of this chicken and egg thing. Like it's good to have economic growth to establish these things, but also these things like having a highly educated population, having a good government, you know, good democratic government, innovation, healthy people, and so forth. That actually promotes economic growth itself. They also mentioned the Brundtland Commission. So if you remember, the Brundtland Commission was uh, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And that's a notion of intergenerational equity, which is a really important concept in sustainability. And intergenerational equity sounds really fancy. All it means is we can we should consider the impacts on future generations. So intergenerational meaning between generations and equity, of course, being, you know, having, uh, giving other people um, the opportunity um, to achieve things like high quality of life and clean environment and so forth. So we need to consider the equity implications of future generations is what intergenerational equity means. Okay. So it needs it should be equitable and balanced. Okay. So again, all the stuff we've been talking about that we need to consider the economic, social and environmental impacts of economic growth. Um, right. So how do we balance all these things? Security with economic growth and environmental damage and so forth. And so, you know, I want to kind of leave it with the, the probably the most critical problem is the eradication of extreme poverty. And if we want to address extreme poverty, extreme poverty causes a lack of development and development also causes a lack, uh, excuse me, extreme poverty. Okay. And so the sort of overall key points here from the World Bank reading is that a large GDP does not always mean a high level of development, okay? 
Increased GDP can lead to all kinds of bad things like greater inequality, overuse of natural resources, and so forth. Okay, so the stuff that we've been talking about. Also, according to the reading, according to the World Bank, equity and social justice are actually really important elements of development. So GDP itself is not enough to indicate um, that, a, that a society is highly developed. Okay, we need to consider other things. And also we should consider the impacts on future generations. Okay, so that's it for the World Bank reading. Uh, and then we'll go over some, moving forward, alternative ways to actually quantify development um, other than just GDP.